What's the Risk, hosted by myself, Daniel Crow, and Peter Mansell, founder of Mansell Financial Group, a financial advice business he founded in 1980. This is a simple video series we hope investors can use to better understand index and portfolio performance, along with addressing some investment questions and dilemmas. This episode is on the S&P 500 index. In Australia, people would know IBV is the BlackRock ETF that aims to provide investors with the performance of the S&P 500 index for fees and expenses. The index is designed to measure the performance of large capitalization US equities. In the US, it would be IBV also from BlackRock and SPY from State Street, while Vanguard has VOO that tracks the index. Your investment philosophy, a book we wrote, it's available at Amazon. Disclaimer, please pause and read. Suffice to say our intent is educational and not rendering financial advice. Uh, these are simple concepts. We just like investors to better understand performance in the short and long term. So periodic performance, this is a great looking table. I guess this is why people say invest in stocks and you'll get a 10% return per annum. Obviously, we'll dig a little bit deeper into that and show it's not always the case. And down the bottom also included a converted AUD return for reference. Yeah, it's a great so this message. Is- this We're going back some 97 years and the return has been just into double digits. I've had a strongly held belief for a very long time that that return is effectively the profit margin that capitalism has built into it as it functions generally efficiently. Some would say not so efficiently, but generally what's available to investors in the longer term. And whether you look at US stocks here or whether you look at Europe or whether you look at the Aussie share market over the same sort of periods, you see the same sort of thing. So a growth of wealth is a little bit of a ridiculous one, but I guess it's always interesting. People often say if you invested a dollar in 1926, you'd have, and my response to that is always, you probably wouldn't be alive. What what do you think of this one? (laughs) I I find it a little bit hard to relate to in some settings. I mean, what have we got? Um, We've nearly got 100 years of of data there. It's very good that Rex Sickfield and Roger Ibbotson went back and uh, put all this together for us, but what sort of value think, do you Daniel, find? Uh, the most important thing is that the chart just depicts compound earnings over 97 years. We all know, you know, that if we just give assets that appreciate in value enough time, there will end up being a huge change in the value of the wealth that you started with. In this particular case, $1 becomes $14,000. It becomes almost incomprehensible. But if you look for argument's sake at the fall around the time of September 11, where the market value was 3,000 and now it's 14,000, it's not so hard to reconcile that you've got four times your money over 23 years. If you take the starting point of that period again and go back to 2000 and you go back to 1981, you've got a value of three or $400 growing to 3000. It's not hard to comprehend really. It's just that when you take the 60 years before that, it's growing $1 to about $600. It's not so hard. But when you start with $1, and you end up at 14,500, it seems almost incomprehensible. But that's the reality. (laughs) The point you made, tongue-in-cheek at the outset, right, there's not a single person alive on the planet that could have actually done this. No, I included a second chart here for actual, a little bit more reference. And I think this is probably goes back to what you were saying there, maybe about, about capitalism. I think this probably has a little bit more value because we see the Second World War ending and then the expansion afterwards. So it's kind of like history in action with stocks and you get to see what happened in that expansionary period afterwards. Oh, it's a great chart too for another reason. You know, you look back at the left-hand end of the chart where you start with a dollar and it grows to about three and, and through the Great Depression, it ends up below a dollar before it starts to recover mm. again. It's on the way back up. And then, you know, Hitler comes to power in uh, in Germany and, and we have World War II and, and the values plunge again. After World War II, there's the rebuilding, you know, the growth of the developed world economies, you know, in a kickoff and bingo from $3 to $36 over the space of some 20 odd years. Not hard to comprehend when you look at the whole chart and and put it in the right context. So range of returns and average return. What's fascinating here is the one year difference in dates between the best and the worst one year return. So a bit of a reminder, if you get the suitcase kicked out of you, if you're not in your seat, you don't get any chance of recovery. Yeah, isn't this a great chart? When you look at that one year result in July of 1931, you'd lost two thirds of your money. So 
you know, if you started with $1,000, you only had 330. But by the July of the next year, you actually had nearly 900. Now, you're not quite back to where you were, but that's a pretty spectacular gain. And that absolutely proves the point you made that if you stay invested, you'll pick up the recovery. If you panic, then you've paid the ultimate price. A little bit different than what we normally do here. This is a rolling 30-year returns um, instead of rolling annual because it's probably a little bit hard to jam the whole one year in there. But I think this is interesting because the first thing to note is there are only two 30-year returns under 8% per annum. And the worst 30-year yeah. return you could have achieved was 7.8% per annum. And then there was a 34-month difference between the start of the best and the worst outcome. So it's the start of the Great Depression and the end, the expansion yeah. afterwards. And and look, it, it again, it absolutely makes perfect sense that the chart would look like this because by the December of 1960 or thereabouts, you've got a starting point where the Great Depression saw share prices just slaughtered before they came back. And equally, the reason the chart's better prior to that is because in the run-up to the Great Depression, share prices had escalated strongly. I think it's a brilliant chart insofar as the, the longer-term average we already know is a bit over 10. And if you put a line of best fit through it, the amount of the yellow bars that are above that line of best fit and what's below are pretty much a perfect match. Historic chance of positive or negative return, pretty much as you'd expect really over that sort of time frame. And there's a lot of data in here too. Uh, monthly, it's 1,176 months, it's 1,174 quarters, and there are 1,165 12-month periods that uh, go into this. It's a great reminder that patients will get rewarded and reacting in a panicked way to adverse market returns will get punished. To look at the 10-year numbers, you've got a 95% historical probability of a positive return and only a 1 in 20 chance of not getting a positive result. The largest fall in time to recovery from the bottom. Um, now, to get that 7.8% per annum return over 30 years, this is what you had to endure, 83.41% uh, fall. Now, we preach discipline, but I guess you'd say this would be a cast iron wheel. And well, yeah. I guess no, no one, I, I assume, probably achieved, well, would have had this happen to them just for the fact that this this is a reconstituted index. Is that right? Because uh, Rex Sinkfeld and Roger Ibbotson went back and rebuilt all of this. So yes. we have them to thank for the, the long-term data. So it wasn't investable. But at the same same stage, people were completely wiped out due to this fall? Oh, definitely. You know, look, the, the Great Depression years were catastrophic. You know, when you consider that, you know, if you had $7 invested in the share market, at the bottom of that dip, you've only got $1 left. It would take incredible courage and patience to wait for it even to get back to, you know, the 1937 level where you've still got about, you've actually got about $5.50 of your original seven. And as you rightly pointed out, it takes till we can get clarity around the end of World War II by the December of 1944 when it was obvious that the Allies would win before the share markets actually recovered where you were. Now, that's 15 years. That takes an enormous amount of patience and conviction, and 15 years is certainly not a short time. Uh, no. Hopefully, investors were well diversified, holding other assets than shares as well to get them through this time, particularly when it came to what they needed to liquidate to spend. But if they did, they got rewarded. And the risk-return relationship, uh, these are all US stocks and bonds that are included. The crisp total market is there near the S&P 500 index. Interesting fact here, also put in a 60-40 uh, for comparison. An interesting fact, standard deviation was almost 30%, 29.51 pre 1945 for the S&P 500, post 1945, it's been 14.6 ending in 2023. Uh, look, I think that uh, the, the degree of volatility in markets, you know, in the earlier period to the later period, that's going to be very heavily influenced by what happened in the Great Depression in the first of those periods. After World War II, of course, we had massive economic growth that translated into significant, you know, stock market returns in the post-World War II era. That stands to reason that the standard deviations in the pre-war and the post-war would actually be very different. And sources and descriptions of data. 
Well, thanks for joining us for this one. Uh, we'll see you again next time. Bye for now.